Gumba Malgan, Gumbanan Yedadu, Yurigiri State Library of Queensland Goo, which is good evening. It's good to see you and welcome friends to the State Library of Queensland. Uh, in Baragam, which is the traditional language of the community that I grew up on, the Darling Downs. And good evening, everyone, and it's fantastic to see such a big crowd here in the auditorium at State Library of Queensland. I'm Vicky McDonald, State Librarian and CEO here at the State Library of Queensland, and on behalf of my colleagues, I welcome you to the conversation cut from a different cloth. But let me begin by acknowledging Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and their continuing connection to land and as custodians of stories for millennia. At State Library of Queensland, we are inspired by this tradition in our work to share and preserve Queensland's memory for future generations. I'd also like to extend a very warm welcome to our facilitator, Jane Howard, Susan Horbeck from The Conversation, and our panellists, Emeritus Professor Peter Spirit, Dr Amy Clark and Michael Aird. So thank you all for joining us this evening. And thank you for attending our special talk series with The Conversation, the world's leading free fact-based news source, written by academics and edited by journalists. Queensland is known as the Sunshine State, and this is certainly reflected in our extensive collection of travel souvenirs. Bursting with bright imagery, Im imagery of tropical fruits and exotic flowers, the tea towels in our collection display the symbols we associate with our state and our idea of what sets us apart. At State Library, we are interested in the stories behind the symbols and how our identity as Queenslanders has changed over time. Our Queensland to a Tea exhibition looks at that identity between 1950 and 2016 through the vibrant Glen R. Cook souvenir textile collection, which holds over 1,500 items. And a special welcome to Glen R. Cook, who's sitting in the front row. Thank you. So um, although the collection is over 1,500 items, we have around 200 on display in the gallery. And these cheerful and affordable souvenirs commemorate family road trips to beaches and outback towns. They also contain once popular recipes, mark notable events like Expo 88, or memorialise a calendar year. Some may make us uncomfortable, as the collection also records political discontent and cultural appropriation, prompting us to consider how we have changed or not since 1950. After the discussion, I invite you to visit the exhibition in the SLQ Gallery on Level 2, and we've kept it open this evening until 8pm, so do, do take a peek if you haven't already. Or you may like to book a place in one of our free curator's tours in the coming weeks to uncover what made tea towels desirable Queenslandiana and what we see the, of them now. Tonight, we will welcome four guests whose fascination with Queensland and its cultural history has inspired thought-provoking books, websites and photography do documenting Queensland life. I look forward to hearing their insights into our history and the future of uh, souvenirs and cultural icons in Queensland. The conversation will be broadcast as on State Library's live stream page and you'll be able to watch this recorded conversation on our website, Facebook page and YouTube channel. We are uh, using Slido this evening to collect questions from both online and people within the auditorium. So if you go to slido.com and enter the event code the conversation or simply scan the QR code that appears on the screen throughout the event, you'll be able to get into slido.com. And you'll see that slido.com is very democratic. As people put in their questions, you can also vote for them and they'll move to the top and so uh, we'll be able to answer those questions as well. So if you are sharing your thoughts about tonight's conversation on social media, we invite you to use the hashtag SLQ the conversation. But now I'd like to introduce our facilitator for the evening, Jane Howard. And Jane is the conversation's art and culture editor. She's also a Walkley Award winning journalist. Her writing has appeared in publications including the ABC, The Guardian, Mianjin and the Sydney Morning Herald. And she sits on the board of Writers South Australia. So please join me in welcoming Jane. But enjoy the evening. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. 
Um, thanks everyone so much for being here. Yeah, my name is Jane. Um, I also just want to begin by acknowledging uh, that we gather here today on Aboriginal land um, and pay my respects to Elders past and present. Um, wonderful panel here tonight. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about them and then we'll jump right into it. Um, so on my right, uh, we have Dr Amy Clark. Amy is a senior lecturer in history, specialising in architectural heritage and material culture at the University of the Sunshine Coast. Her primary research interests are focused on the promotion of regional and national identities via architecture, themed environments and cultural heritage. Uh, we then have Michael Ed. Uh, Michael Ed is director of the UQ Anthropology Museum and an ARC research fellow. He has worked in the area of Aboriginal arts and cultural heritage since 1985, maintaining an interest in documenting aspects of urban Aboriginal history and culture. And on the end, we have Professor P Peter Spirit. He is an emeritus professor at the School of Historical and F Philosophical Inquiry at the, in the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences at the University of Queensland. His research interests include housing, public transport, heritage conservation, coastal green space, and urban water policy. And right on the end here, we have Megan, who's interpreting today. Um, unfortunately, we only have one uh, interpreter today, so she may need to take some breaks. Um, so please <laughs> be kind to, to her. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, Peter, do you wanna uh, set us off? Peter's gonna give us a bit of a, uh, some information about uh, the collection of, of tea towels. Well, welcome to the new church of tea towel lovers. <laughs> we have the aforementioned Glenn Cook to thank for amassing this, uh, this marvellous collection. Um, quite a bit of it, by the way, he extracted from eBay and very occasionally he's been beaten to it by people using naughty sniping programs on eBay. So if there's anybody who's done that here, then you better leave the room straight away. <laughs> so this at the moment is the world's largest tea tower collection. And of course, thematically coherent, not least because of the concentration on, um, on, on Queensland. And we might try now and bring up a, the first of a couple of slides, if we could please if they'll come up. Okay, so this is my absolute favourite. <laughs> this, the, you, you cannot go past this tea towel. E everything in Queensland is fantastic <laughs> and everything that's wrong with the rest of Australia isn't, isn't in Queensland. So as you can see, sharks are mainly to be found in Western Australia because there are no sharks off the Queensland coast. Dirty industry is only to be found in New South Wales and, uh, and Victoria. Uh, waterless deserts, flat wasteland, salt mines, winos, that sums up South Australia. <laughs> winos for South Australia. Queensland has the freshest fruit, the best golfers, the best lovers, the best drivers, more sunshine, etc., etc. This this uh, this uh, tea towel comes out of a long a long tradition of what what's known as Queensland concept um, exceptionalism, and uh, we might um, have the next slide, which uh, which. Uh, Oh, that's rather good. So that's the ginger, that's the ginger factory, the one that was at Budrum and has now moved to uh, to Yandina. So when you go, I imagine quite a few of you have already been to the exhibition, but it produces fascinating um, responses from people. And a new one I heard the other day was somebody who was visiting a household where the tea towels in the... Um, in the pantry were in two different boxes, but this person didn't understand that the top box was the tea towels to be used and the bottom <laughs> box was for tea towels that were never to be used. 
So we might now go on to a couple more slides of those objects. Oh, this is one of my favourites, oh, Peter. This is, yeah, yeah. Yes, OK. Yep. So that's, uh, that's Flo's scones. And they, that, that's a Reef Productions one. I mean, a lot of these tea towels were very widely distributed. Murray Views, the postcard manufacturers in, in Gympie did, did quite a lot of them. So they, I mean, most of them will never be rare, uh, but what's happened in the, in the collector's market now, of course, is that um, occasionally there'll be an iconic tea towel or a structure that's competed for, like, you know, Lennon's um, Hotel at Broadbeach or something. Uh, we might have a, just a couple more if they're coming up. Now, here is a sort of a counter example, as you can see. <laughs> so this is, I visited Queensland and discovered miles of golden beaches, Joe Bajorki Peterson. Lots of luxury hotels, Joe Bajorki Peterson. So quite a few of them have a more explicit kind of uh, message. And we might now go to the last couple of items. Just keep scrolling through the tea towels for a bit and then we might get to a couple of the uh, souvenir objects. OK. Now, um, with, uh, with in my household, along with Anne Gilmore, we collect what's called Studio Anna pottery. This is made by a Czech potter in Sydney, in Marrickville, between 1954 and 1982. And they're all hand-painted. So the, these are hotly, hotly contested, the, these sorts of items. What I love about this one of Caloundra is that in the background, it's probably a bit hard to see, you can still see the Glasshouse Mountains. Now, if you go and stand at the very bit of Caloundra now, all you can see are high-rise buildings on both sides. You can't see the Glasshouse Mountains at all. And the last, uh, the last one is uh, Mount Isa. <laughs> so what's interesting, a bit like the tea towels, a lot of this sort of um, souvenir wear is sort of celebratory, but they're still quite happy to tackle industrial, industrial towns as worthy of, worthy of note. OK. <laughs> Thanks so much, Peter. Uh, Michael, we were chatting earlier about your sort of early memories of, of souvenirs. Can you share some of that with the with the with the room? Well, I grew up in born in Southport in, in the early 1960s, and so growing up, my, my earliest memories by the late 1960s, and going night shopping quite often you know, with my parents in my pajamas, um, <laughs> and you know and. And I was sort of, even as a, as a small child, probably, you know, four years old or so, I was aware of the fact that you couldn't go night shopping basically anywhere else in Australia. And even middle of Sydney or Melbourne, you couldn't go and buy things at eight o'clock at night. But at Surface Paradise, um, you could. So, so I guess that um, to be surrounded by all the glitz and the glamour and all the, um, the neon signs, I remember, particularly the one of the advertising the suntan lotion where the dog would pull the little girl's pants down. <laughs> um, and so, so it was just this, yeah, to me it was just normal. And then, and then of course, especially looking at the exhibition the other day, here, here are all these tea towels documenting exactly what I saw as a, you know, as a four or five year old. So it really brought back memories and the fact that that, that sort of tourist image was, was really my life. It was, you know, that mm -hmm. was my hometown. That's what I grew up with. I mean, thinking about the tourist image, Amy, I'm wondering how do we start to think about distilling a place or a group of people or anything into one one image? That's a, I think that's a really great question. I mean, you can look at this sort of uh, example that we have here on the uh, of Mount Isa, that the painting of Mount Isa on the plate. Um, clearly, there's not much going on in Mount Isa, so <laughs> I'm guessing the decision was an easy one for them. Um, but it is also something that they're, they're very much known for. So I, I think it's, it, it's largely about stereotypes, and I think you can see that coming through in the collection as well, in the tea towels. There's certainly a kind of winky acknowledgement of, I mean, some of the other examples we've seen, that first one that you were showing us, Peter, full of stereotypes. 
Um, so I think that's part of it. And I think it's, you know, it's, it often comes from the region itself, from the community. So it's what they're proud of. It's something that they want to see promoted, um, you know, because it has to pass muster with the locals. You know, you don't want to offend the locals. So I think it's, it's sort of a fine balance between the stereotype and the reality. Mm -hmm. um, some eagle eyes in the audience might have noticed some slightly strange objects on the tables here. Um, so talking about distilling places down into to one item. Michael, I wonder if you can tell us a little <laughs> bit about um, the souvenirs you've brought in to share with us today. Well, I'll start with a, a trip to, to Venice um, recently. My partner and I, Piali, went to Venice and, um, and I really wanted to find a glow-in-the-dark Jesus, but I couldn't find one, so I had to settle for, for, for Pope Francis and Jesus. And I really found that the, the Pope was in every shop, but Jesus was a lot harder to find. <laughs> um, and along with, I could have bought, you know, there was soccer players and basketball players and politicians and Bob Marley and Donald Trump, um, but I was really proud of the two. My, and, and I posted a photo of these two, um, I hear, here they are, on, on Facebook. And, and one of my most Catholic friends responded with, you keep good company. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I guess the other things I brought is um, something, you know, a friend, I was given a gift voucher to buy something at a tourist company, Murray Walker, which is run by Joe Skeen Jr. And <clears throat> Joe and his father, Joe Skeen Sr. in particular, they've produced probably, you've never, must have produced millions of boomerangs over the last 50 years or so. And I really sort of really love this one because it's, even though it's an unpainted plywood boomerang, which some people would not hold up, you know, with great regard, but you can see that this is one that he's put a lot of work in. It's really well made. So even something as simple as this that some people would think is touristy, to me it, it shows, you know, that balance between producing something for the mass market, ha handcrafting something for a mass market and doing it well. And the third thing... Um, is a present from one of my daughters recently. Um, and where is it? I can get it the right way up. The Chico Roll. Again, my earliest memories. Um, now, this was an image that, you know, every shopping precinct had a snack bar and every snack bar would have had multiple Chico Roll signs up everywhere. And me and my brothers, we definitely, you know, that was our big thrill going anywhere was to have a, a Chico roll and a milkshake. <laughs> so a, a really big part of my childhood. <laughs> um, and Amy, you brought a couple of things too. Yeah, mine are not as good as, as yours, <laughs> I'm afraid. I, I have also, in keeping, I've got a, a statue here, a little figurine of the Virgin Mary. Um, now, the reason I brought this is, you may be able to see on the bottom, uh, it's Notre Dame. So uh, I brought this, I guess, because souvenirs can sometimes be remnants of places that have changed dramatically since. So, although I don't consider myself to be overly religious, when I saw the Notre Dame Cathedral in flames a few years ago in Paris, um, I did pause, you know, looking at this and thinking, I was there once. That was that sort of tangible connection to a place that was then, you know, being beamed around the, uh, the world in our, our news headlines. So that's my serious one. But I also have a tiny Winnie the Pooh he has a tiny little bee in his hand. I took a bunch of students to Vanuatu uh, at the end of 2019, right before COVID hit. And we weren't there, we were there to study Vanuatu heritage. We weren't there to study souvenirs. <laughs> but Vanuatu is one of, Port Vila is one of those places that is just, the, the main street is just souvenir shop after souvenir shop, all run by Chinese um, business people. All of the souvenirs made in China. And I said to my students, I'm going to give you the competition of finding the craziest souvenir this week while we're here. And the winner will get the craziest souvenir I found, which was this tiny little Winnie the Pooh being <coughs> sold in Vanuatu. The winning souvenir entry from one of my students was an Osama Bin Laden face mask <laughs> being sold in Vanuatu in a souvenir shop. The runner-up was a Make America Great Again hat, also being sold in Vanuatu. <laughs> so souvenirs transcend borders. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, one of the questions that we've got on Slido is uh, what decade is the first tea towel from? I think that's probably a bit too broad a question, but I wonder if you can talk to... This, the, in this... In yeah, Glenn's that, I think that's what I was going to say, is let's it's, narrow it down a bit. It's the 1950s, and it raises an interesting question about when are, are souvenirs, including tea towels, absolutely redolent of their, t of their particular time and when aren't they? When aren't they? So those of you who have already seen the exhibition will see that in the late 1950s and for the centenary of responsible government in Queensland, there was only one building that Queenslanders could be proud of and that was the Brisbane City Hall. And the Brisbane City Hall appears to be almost as tall as the state of Queensland when superimposed <laughs> on the map. But really is quite an extraordinary, <laughs> extraordinary image. And of course, Brisbane was proud of its city hall because Brisbane has the only metropolitan-wide council in Australia, but now the city hall is so overshadowed, nobody would bother to feature, a, feature it any longer on a tea towel much. Well, that sort of, that takes us back about 70 years. Um, yeah, but yeah. Amy wrote a piece uh, for the conversation recently about the history of souvenirs. Do you want to talk about sort of how old souvenirs as a genre Ah, oh. yeah. I mean, I just assumed that we had invented souvenirs in the '80s in Queensland. Um, <laughs> just felt very on brand for Queensland in the '80s. But it turns out people have been, you know, creating, manufacturing souvenirs for thousands of years. Um, I think there's a, a really great photo or two in that article that you, I think you found, Jane, um, of some r ancient Roman metal bowls that had been uncovered in an archaeological dig at Hadrian's Wall. So there were locals there that saw their kind of market in the Roman soldiers that were stationed there and were making these metal bowls for the Romans to take home with them. So, yeah, we've been doing it for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. um, Michael, we were talking about before as well about what isn't in, in this collection of tea towels and, and what stories sort of uh, don't get told mm -hmm. through souvenirs. Well, I think the, um, the first tea towel is a great example. It was certainly, I think, my favourite out of the whole exhibition. <laughs> um, it just really demonstrates that people don't want true versions of history. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. And people are happy to pay money for, you know, wrong versions of history. And even the size of Queensland. You know, you can exaggerate, <laughs> you can make up anything you want and people will pay money for it. <laughs> Um, so I think that's, you know, as a history professional, I think about that all the time. Um, and that's why I think this exhibition is so wonderful, because even though it's so extreme, it's, I mean, it's such a, such a, as you say, such a biased, twisted, <laughs> wrong commercial... I don't know. I, I, I didn't see any <laughs> historical inaccuracies in any of those details. <laughs> and and, and I, the other one I'd like to comment is the one up on the screen now. That's my hometown. Mm. And it's yep. absolutely geographically incorrect. <laughs> and there's an island that shouldn't be there. <laughs> um, and, like, nobody cares. So I think this, <laughs> this really tells a lot about, you know, people are happy with crap versions of history. <laughs> and the best part about that is they're being taken... I love this. I love thinking about these souvenirs that are wrong. Yeah. Being taken to other countries and then those people receiving them and assuming that that's what Queensland is. Mm -hmm. I just love that idea of all of these people in, you know, Japan and the UK and the US and Canada and what have you, with this very clear idea of Australia or Queensland that absolutely does not match up with what we have. It's brilliant. I think a word that can very easily be described to a lot of, of the objects in this collection is kitsch. Um, how do you... Anyone wants to jump in? How do you see the word kitsch? Does it get a bad rap or, or should we embrace the kitsch? I think it cuts both ways. I mean, I think this, um, this probably says as much about um, Bangladeshi business people in, uh, in Italy <laughs> as Michael was explaining to me before <laughs> than anything else. Um, I guess the... I mean, the, the importance of the objects is that they are very widely disseminated most most of these sorts of souvenirs are very reasonably priced. If you're trying to evoke 
a very particular time and a very particular place, souvenirs can be a great way to can be a great way to do it. I mean the um, the place of manufacturers has changed. So b before World War One, a lot of um, Australian tourist crockery came from Germany. Uh, then, in the interwar years, it came from Czechoslovakia. Then, as with the Studio Anna stuff, we, we could have an economy here at the time where you could manufacture those souvenirs in Australia. But when we open up to Japanese manufacturing in the late 1950s, then suddenly the J Japanese become the m a major source of tourist uh, souvenirs for Australia. So you can read the economic history of mm -hmm. the 20th century here through the souvenirs in a funny kind of way. Mm. Through the kitsch. Yeah, through the kitsch. Yep. I, yep. I'm, I'm an unapologetic lover of kitsch. Um, I just, I don't understand why kitsch is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. I'm not actually sure who decided, like who, who, who decided that? You know, who decided that there was good art and bad art? And I think that's what kitsch, that term is often used in a derogatory way to sort of dismiss things as being bad or cheap or for the lower classes. And it's sort of drawing a line between kind of commercial art that is affordable and enjoyable for most people and the quote unquote highbrow art that you know only the most educated people can appreciate and I just rally against that you know I just if you like it great <laughs> you know like why do we need to have these ideas of kitsch being bad I love kitsch you know you clearly love kitsch look at your bobblehead <laughs> <laughs> you know like I, I just and we we're people that probably should be very much against kitsch given our jobs but we get it so why, why are we so hung up on this idea of kitsch being bad? And I think there's, you know, obviously, so the 1950s was that era when there was so much Aboriginal, as Glenn Cook knows all about, so much Aboriginal kitsch being produced and basically all being produced by non-Aboriginal people. Mm. And I don't really have the, the research or the facts to support this, but I sort of wonder how much, once that non-Aboriginal produced Aboriginal iconography came out, how much it encouraged Aboriginal artists themselves to start competing. Absolutely. And I think there yeah, really wow. was a big in uptake of Aboriginal people moving into the tourism industry in the 50s and 60s. Mm. Yeah, that's really fascinating. Um, one of our um, questions is, is there a tea towel you wish was in the exhibition that didn't make it? Do you have any, anything that you wish was up there, Peter? Well, I've had a few discussions with Glenn about whether there are more protest tea towels around than we realise, because um, protest tea towels might just have been sold for, you know, did anybody, for instance, I don't know the answer to this, did anybody ever do a tea towel about stopping sand mining on Stradbroke Island? It's quite possible. So there are certain areas where the tea towels aren't, um, you know, in the big tourist domain mm. shops where there is a possibility that there are more protest tea towels around than we, than we actually know about mm -hmm. at the moment. It's more a sort of folk art in that case, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, here's a question that I was prepared for. Uh, can the panel comment on how Queensland will look on Olympic souvenirs in 2032? <laughs> I've already, I'm, I'm going to do this again, um, I've already talked about this on uh, radio recently and it was perhaps the proudest moment of my career <laughs> that I managed to say the word kangaroo scrotum <laughs> <laughs> live on air and now I've just done it a second time. <laughs> we, I mean, we've all seen them, right? And the stuffed cane toads and things. Like you, you can go to Queen Street Mall now and walk. I don't know if they sell kangaroo scream. I, 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 I am familiar with the concept. <laughs> <laughs> Just making sure it's not a, a singularly Queensland thing. Uh, can we not do that? Like, that, that's, that's my question. Like, I, I know that I've just defended kitsch, but that's just a little bit too far, if you ask me. So, uh, I'm, I'm not really... I don't have a, a strong feeling about what we should have as our 2032 souvenirs, but I would like to not have that. <laughs> We should, in my view, take inspiration from the Melbourne Olympics, where really good quality mm. souvenirs were produced, 
almost all were made in Australia. There's a huge collector's item uh, market for them now, but this includes using Bakelite, plastic, ceramics. Almost every one of the souvenirs produced for the Melbourne Olympics was fantastic. Almost every souvenir produced for the Sydney Olympics was made overseas and was utter crap. <laughs> the quality was awful, the design was awful, the glassware falls apart. So, so Brisbane ought to try and pull up its so socks and do something <laughs> with better materials locally manufactured and, and with local designers. Mm. So I think looking back at the 2018 Commonwealth Games on the Gold Coast, um, I guess you sort of go, one, looking at what they produced, um, there was some pretty, you know, um, so I say, yeah, I was not impressed with <laughs> <laughs> with their their um, some of the things that they put their their, their brand mm, on, mm. and and obviously to get yeah to get your you know there's people selling tourist items at the associate you know parallel to the games, mm. but to get the games brand on your item is a big deal, and so I think the standard of what they allowed their brand to go on wasn't wasn't of a high standard. Um, and I remember back Expo 88 was, was the, I think there was some good, you know, there was like Noel Doyle had the contract, he was the only person that had the contract, that was able to produce Aboriginal design t-shirts with the Expo logo, logo mm -hmm. on. And those shirts were so, they were everywhere and they were good quality and appreciated and, and particularly Aboriginal people everywhere were wearing mm -hmm. those, ex even though Aboriginal people were um, politically against Expo 88, they still wore these shirts because they were <laughs> such good shirts. <laughs> And I think all I can say in summary of what to expect at the Olympic Games, all I can say is I'm in fear. <laughs> <laughs> I think you touched on something really interesting there and you were talking about it before as well um, with the boomerang is sort of like the qu artisan quality. Um, and so do you think when people are looking for souvenirs, do you think more people are going to start looking for high quality uh, objects or, or is the sort of the, the cheap plastic always going to win out? It's a good question. I mean, the, <laughs> the, the Sydney stuff was awful and the shops that it was sold in were awful too. So I think I, I agree with Michael entirely. The quality of the artistic enterprise is important, the sorts of materials that are used, and it shouldn't just be sort of lowest common denominator overseas manufacture, which is what Sydney offered up. Mm -hmm. um, Michael, one of the other questions uh, here... Oh, I just lost it. Um, it was on the screen. It was. It was about um, like what. What is the future of uh, souvenirs now that we have photography everywhere? You're a photographer. How do you sort of see collecting imagery and collecting objects? Well, well, obviously with digital, you know, so many things can be done digitally now, and I think with a, well, particularly, in, you know, I'm looking at a lot of the advertising around especially with sort of screen, digital screens. There's still, I think, and, and the way people have, have T-shirts, bright, brightly designed T-shirts for nearly every event. You know, you get, I mean, even, you know, in the Aboriginal community, people have T-shirts made up for a funeral. You've got bowling clubs, fishing clubs, golf clubs, have these incredibly, you know, elaborate um, T-shirts made up because the technology's there. It's affordable technology. Um, to me, I think, some of those shirts are really ugly, you know, um, <laughs> and there's too many of them, you know. So, so in a sense, it's it's it's. So I think in 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 ten or twenty years' time, you look back and go, oh, there's a circa 2022 mm -hmm. t-shirt because mm -hmm. it's it's that trap of people, you know, or, or sorry, the the industry running with the latest affordable technology, which can become very dated. And that's, but I guess Peter, you know, as Peter's been talking about the production. So, you know, some of these tea... Well, I mean, I wouldn't have guessed that was a 1950s tea towel. That could have come from the 70s or the 80s, you know, or the 90s. Um, so, um, yes, so I think that's one of the beauty of the tea towels is there, there's something timeless about them. Mm. There, there is that... Mm -hmm. Even to this day, we're getting tea towels produced that are in that sort of... Still maintaining that 50-year-old... Or 50... You know, plus... Yeah, you know, sure. 50-plus-year-old yeah, yeah. screen printing technology is still sort of there. 
And the physicality, I think, yeah. is important. I mean, everybody in this room has probably now got a mobile phone full of hundreds of images. I mean, the fact that you can actually hold mm. the tea towel and mm. that in certain circumstances it's very useful <laughs> <laughs> is a big attraction. It's got utility. I think there is definitely something about... Uh, it's almost like a canon of souvenirs that won't die. You know, like the, the tea towel is an example, but, you know, the teaspoon as well. Um, I'm sure we've all got souvenir teaspoons sitting in our collections. And, you know, kids are still collecting them. You know, kids, kids are still really attached to that. It is the, the materiality. It's the experience of holding something. Whether they actually ever use it as a teaspoon, I don't think that matters. You know, I think there is something about just knowing that it's special because it's a souvenir that, that gives people that feeling of, you know, having a special experience. Great. Um, Kate asks, uh, where do postcards fit into this genre? Um, the Queensland exceptionalism and winky nods to stereotypes, or do they have the same role as, as the tea towel? Well, I think postcards are, are regrettably definitely on the wane. Mm. I've always been a great... Um, fan of um, Murray View's postcards in Gympie, one of the biggest postcard manufacturers in Australia, still running. Um, but the quality of the postcards and the imagination behind a lot of them has gone down a lot. So originally you often were using original photos for your postcards. Um, I don't think there's, there's not much Queensland exceptionalism shown in postcards other than the kind of bikini curl Bikini, bikini girl image and so on, that, that still happens. But people simply are using more digital cards. Somehow the tea towel, I think, is going to survive in mm. a way that the postcards won't. I mean, there's a huge postcard collector's market for older postcards, as you probably know, but uh, I think the tea towel's got a better future. There's been some fascinating studies of... Uh, architecture in postcards and not Queensland necessarily but just generally the idea of postcards and it's a pretty strong argument that stands up that postcards are often the thing that kind of establishes that a place is worth going to see mm -hmm. so it sort of gets repeated over and over and over again over decades and that's what people learn is the thing to go and see at that place so there is a sort of backwards and forwards conversation between souvenirs when you think about postcards and the actual place the travel location, mm -hmm. which I think is quite interesting. And I think, well, again, looking at technology, once, you know, some people didn't have cameras and so a postcard would be, you know, the yeah. only way they're going to get a photo and, and obviously share it with others, send, you know, send it, you know, post, it, post the postcards to, to family and friends. And now, you, you know, everybody's, mostly everybody's got a mobile phone and they're connected to um, Facebook or whatever other technology. So now you're not posting anything, you're, well, you're posting it online. Mm. So, so technology changes. And also, and, and looking at old photo albums where even people with cameras knew that some of these great, the best shot will be the postcard shot better than their shot. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, it's interesting seeing photo albums where the postcards just merge in mm. with the actual family, family photos. Um, is there such a thing as a truly sustainable souvenir? Well, the tea towel would have to be top of the agenda. I think, I think it could be. <laughs> you can use it. It's, you know, you can, it's, it's got a visual impact and it's practical. And if it's made of natural fibres too, not, you know, polyester, hmm? then it's also well, degradable in theory. Lemon, yeah. 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 But I think you, you go to any any sort of tourist um, type place. And of course there's locals who would love to be able to produce mm. souvenirs and sell them and make a living from it. But I think in most cases they're struggling because they're competing yeah. with the, the yeah. cheap imports. Yeah. yeah. Um, to go back to that first tea towel, this is, someone has a, has a question. Um, so the first tea towel says Brisbane has the best street marches. Um, and this person wanted to know if they meant traditional ones like St Patrick's Day because their first thought was political street marches. And this goes back to what you were saying earlier about politics and protest. Yeah, yeah, well, it's a sort of... Um, it's the most exciting street marches. I mean, whoever worked on this tea <laughs> towel really enjoyed themselves. Yeah. And it's certainly got a few sort of uh, 
hidden hidden messages in there. You know, it's not it it uh, it requires a bit of interrogation. <laughs> I can see sort of the 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 pasta overboiling on the stove a bit because you've gotten so distracted looking at this tea towel <laughs> yeah. trying to decode all of it. I don't, I don't know of any other state that has this genre of tea towel mm -hmm. in Australia. Well, that was one of the questions, is, mm. um, yep. is this a uniquely Queensland phenomenon? Well, you've got, I mean, every state has lots and lots of tea towels <laughs> and places like, you know, and, and sometimes smaller communities like, say, um, Lord Howe Island or Norfolk Island do actually have silk screen tea, ta tea towels produced then and there, which is a, a great idea as a, as a souvenir. I, th I think Queensland's got um, the shape of the state lends itself to the tea towel. That's quite important, you know. New South Wales is a bit blocky, really. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, Victoria's, you know, very small and even hard to draw. So s somehow the shape of Queensland works for a tea towel. <laughs> Amy, you were talking before about uh, kids collecting. Did you collect anything as a, as a kid? And oh, have has anything sort of everything. followed you through to adulthood? Yes, although my mother moved to Tasmania recently and has thrown out most of it. So, yeah, we're not talking. Um, <laughs> she might be watching on the live stream. Hi, Mum. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I think it's a very natural thing for kids to want to collect things, um, whether it's souvenirs or just, you know basketball cards or, you know, whatever, Tarzos was the big thing when I was a kid or things that you used to get in the bread bag, which they don't seem to do anymore, um, football cards, a AFL football mm -hmm. cards you used to get in the, in the um, bread bags. I think it's, it's sort of tapping into something very um, innate about children, which is they just like stuff, you know, like kids just want to have stuff everywhere. And I think there's a, a desire when you're going to a new place um, as a child, certainly, I think I, I had this experience going on summer holidays of just being so in awe of the place because, you know, you're a kid and you're going to this new place that you've never been before and it's still kind of quite novel and you, you haven't kind of got old, bored with, with travel any, at, at that stage. So I think there is a desire for kids to have, you know, the pens and the snow globes and T-shirts and hats and stuffed toys and... I think it's just natural. And I think children, when they go somewhere, they have often have some money in their... Well, in the yeah, past, yeah, now they have credit cards, money. but they had money in their pocket, and that money, they couldn't go home with any of that money. <laughs> it had to be spent <laughs> on something, and that's where the really cheapest and... Yeah. ..cheapest, nastiest stuff, that's where that was the, you know, if it, that would get sold. Yeah. <laughs> um, Michael, before you were talking about looking at... Uh, these tea towels now and sort of remembering these experiences of your childhood. One of the questions that we have, um, do you have any feelings towards souvenirs that don't speak to you? Like what, what do you sort of, what, what does what do Amy's souvenirs mean to you? <laughs> well, does that glow in the dark? <laughs> <coughs> if I say yes, will you buy it off me for 50 bucks? Because as I said, I really wanted the glow in the dark Jesus and couldn't find one. Do you one. want to swap? <laughs> No, sadly it doesn't, but that would have been amazing. Um, well, I can't say. Um, I guess, you know, you know looking at, at this, this collection, you know, I, th I think what, what strikes me the most is that the, there's, there's a small number of stereotypically obvious Indigenous content mm -hmm. and the rest is absolutely no Indigenous sort of content at all. So, so I think, to me, that really sums up um, the way society sees Aboriginal culture. It has to fit in a neat box mm -hmm. and, it, and it isn't part of the mainstream stories. It mm -hmm. has to be, you know, stories have to be told in a stereotypical way, generally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Peter, what about you? When you were sort of, uh, you were doing evaluation on the collection, what, what's the difference between looking at this, this collection to assign a value to it and the way that we all experience it, which is seeing this sort of curated um, look. How, do, how, how does your brain sort of approach the task, I guess, is what I'm asking. Well, what I like about the collection, I, I guess, is that it isn't aesthetically selective. 
And while I agree with, with Michael that a lot's left out of the tea towels, there's one thing that these Queensland tea towels always tell the truth about, even if a bit indirectly, that is the shocking overdevelopment of the Queensland coastline, particularly on the Gold Coast, mm. the Sunshine Coast and Cairns. Because every time these tea towels will have a high-rise block of flats and we're supposed to be worshipping the, you know, <laughs> the high-rise apartments. So I think there's a, um, there's a sense in which, I mean, if this, was, if this was an art gallery, they would only be collecting tea towels that have been designed by named artists, mm -hmm. for instance, whereas it's the, it's the plurality of the collection that is the big plus. And also, um, a lot of the designs are quite amateur, some are more sophisticated, even that kind of captures the... Look, it, it, it all, it's also quite good from the domestic point of view, you know, what, what do you use in a kitchen? Mm. Yeah, I think that's that. That's why it works well as a collection. That's but one of the one of the other questions we have. Um, someone says that a lot of music artists now have tea towels as part of their merchandise offerings, um, and so why are tea towels the must-have collectible? I think you were just touching on that a bit then. Well, they're um, they're light, they're portable. If you're slightly overweight, you can stuff them in your back pocket. <laughs> uh, and they've, they've, they've got a bit of a life. They've got a bit of a life to them. And I, I guess the... Back to the earlier question about postcards, it looks like they'll be around for a long time. But, but other than that, some things change enormously in this world. So stamp collecting is no longer a popular pastime, mm -hmm. except in China. Really? So the, these sorts of, um, you know, there are some people in this audience sufficiently mature, probably <laughs> mainly men, to have bought stamps from Seven Seas Stamps at Dubbo. <laughs> and these were huge stamp dealers in the 50s and 60s when schoolboys collected stamps. That, that's, as a collecting area, it's just died completely. Mm. There's still an investment area in high-end stuff, but otherwise, mm -hmm. gone. Sort of going back, I think, to technology. This, this is old technology, mm -hmm. you know. People still use tea towels. Mm. And, but also, I think, design-wise, there's still, you know, there's still people producing tea towels with that old, you know, artistically old style to it. So there's something, and I guess it's a bit like, you know, vinyl records, you know, people thought they were going to go out, now they've come back, so there's something about that technology that people love. Mm -hmm. And I guess um, album, you know, the, the vinyl albums have vinyl, have, have art, you know, art mm. on the covers that are probably reflective of that earlier era as mm -hmm. well. Yes, I wonder whether it's the medium of the tea towel that makes it so appealing to, you know, music, you know, bands and so forth. It's a blank canvas, essentially. Mm -hmm. You know, as, in terms of other types of collectibles, it's a lot harder to, I guess, get your point across on, you know, a figurine or a postcard or a stamp or a teaspoon, whereas the tea towel is really just ready-made. You know, it is essentially a canvas. So it does make sense that there is a kind of renewed interest in it from other parts of, uh, I guess, consumer culture. Uh, someone asks, what was the origin of Queensland as the sunshine state? Peter, can you talk to that for us? Uh, oh, it's um, it's um, <laughs> <laughs> complicated, but <laughs> it, it, it starts in the in the nineteen fifties. There's a huge bo battle about who can call themselves the Gold Coast, who can call themselves the Sunshine Coast, and um, I guess it. At the, at the time these slogans arose, we still, believe it or not, had state government-owned tourist bureaus and they did most of the bookings. Government, you know, so the Queensland government had tourist bureau in Sydney, it had another one in, in Melbourne. And it started a, a very successful tagline, uh, which has is, which is stuck, the Sunshine, Co the Sunshine State, the Gold Coast, the Sunshine Coast, there's really no equivalent in any other state of that kind of a tagline mm -hmm. that's so, that's so um, widespread in, in marketing. It's, un, it's unusual. 
Um, one of my favourite travel posters from an earlier era is by a famous Victorian poster artist called Percy Tromp, and he shows a family of penguins walking from Victoria to Cairns. It's a beautifully designed uh, poster, and the slogan is, Go North for Warmth. <laughs> now, just think how oppressive it was in the 1930s in Melbourne to see on your local railway station, because this is where they were pasted up, a poster with penguins who'd realised that they might as well give up on Victoria and go north for warmth for their holidays. It's a, a long, long theme, mm. the sun for marketing Queensland. Um, similar question, um, Stacey asks, do you think changes to our collective identity can be made in a top-down way? So if the number plates were changed from the Sunshine State to Smart State. <laughs> Amy? I, I can't be the only person that was deeply distressed <laughs> when that happened. Um, I, I was so offended <laughs> that the state government, it was the Peter Beattie government, was trying to tell us that we were now the quote-unquote smart state. Um, I don't know why that riled me, but it really did, and I suspect a lot of other people were the same. We've now gone back to the Sunshine State on number plates, I think, haven't we? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Which, yep. which basically answers that yep. question. Obviously, it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> and we really resented being called smart. So... <laughs> <laughs> I, it's, not just, it's not just Queensland that's done this. I think, um, I think Victoria has tried to... It, it's claimed to be the premier state or the number one state. Please correct me if I'm wrong. New South Wales. No, New South was, uh, Victoria was the education state, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. I mean, for a while, they've all played around a bit with their number plates. <laughs> the, yeah. the festival state. state. Yeah. 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 South yeah. Australia. Yeah. 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 I, I just think the Sunshine State, as you say, Peter, it's, it just... It, it was so clearly a, a kind of... It just went hand in hand with how people feel about Queensland and still feel about Queensland. And I, it just was crazy that they even tried to take that away from us. <laughs> One of the other questions, um, should our t tourist tea towels be used in the kitchen or framed on the wall? And I was wondering, uh, Michael, what, uh, what is the fate of your Chico roll towel? It, it will have... Yeah, um, actually, I was in trouble off my daughter today because it hasn't yet joined the other four tea towels that are hung in my kitchen. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, mine are hanging too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't use does, them. Does anybody here have a framed tea towel on display in their own home? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good. And uh, what what is the scene? Brilliant. Kendo. Uh, and, it, and it's framed. It's framed. Yeah. That could be worth some money, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I mean, on that, uh, what value do we place on these objects? Like mm. sort of a financial value, uh, emotional value? How do we measure value when it comes to souvenirs and um, how they interact with our memories of a place? It's a tricky one, I think, because they, they're both... They, they, these souvenirs are sort of simultaneously incredibly valuable to us as individuals and worthless <laughs> because there's hundreds of them, thousands of them. Um, but there are also, I guess, there are more specific types of souvenirs that aren't necessarily mass-manufactured and intended as souvenirs. So um, out of curiosity, does anyone else in the room have a piece of the Berlin Wall? Yeah, <laughs> I do too. Um, we might have to do a roundup here yeah. for, for cultural appropriation. Well, now, so <laughs> I don't want to tell you that your pieces of the Berlin Wall are not real, um, but there is a chance that they're not real. I, I think there's there's definitely something about owning a, a souvenir like that that sort of transcends the kind of mass manufacture. And you, that feeling of holding on to a piece of history, I think, is quite a magical thing that I don't know that you can necessarily, you know, ascribe a, a financial value to. But, Peter, you tried to value the collection, the souvenir collection, the tea towel collection, didn't you? Yeah, well, it's... Um, I mean, I, I got out of Glen that the most expensive one I think you ever had to buy was um, 
$45 on eBay, but then he's been outbid on some. Mm. So we're going to have to get the eBay police out onto this <laughs> one. So there's someone else coming for the title of the <laughs> biggest tea towel collection. <laughs> well, ever. that'll be an interesting question, won't it? That's <laughs> right. That'll be very hard to, very, very hard to get a better collection than this one on Queensland, mm. though. I think the dilemma is once you've, well, for me, I've got, you know, tea towels hanging in my kitchen, which I value, and I see them as being too, too valuable to wipe the dishes with. Mm. And maybe one day I'll just get bored with them and start wiping the dishes with them. So it's sort of when, when does that point, you know, come when you decided they're not valuable anymore and you, you're just going to use them? Um, we're running very close to time, so I'm going to ask one more question um, for each of the panellists to answer. Um, when we think about Queensland being represented in souvenirs, what should we be putting on our tea towels or, or on our teaspoons or in our figurines? How do you see, how would you uh, capture Queensland in, in souvenirs and mem memorabilia? I, I moved to Queensland when I was 11. Um, and to me, Queensland was the big pineapple. And it still is. Um, <laughs> like the first thing that comes into my mind when someone says Queensland is just a big stonking pineapple. Um, I'm not sure why, <laughs> but like it's just, there's just some weird short, cultural shorthand in my head that just Queensland equals pineapple. Um, so yes, that's my answer, pineapples. Well, the eagle eyed might have noticed the little pineapple in our beautiful bouquet on the stage here today, so Queensland is proudly showing off. Michael. Well, for me, I've grown up, you know, in the shadow of surface paradise, literally looking across the river at it and I've seen, I think, I think when I was as far back as I can remember, I think two high rises existed. So I've seen, you know, all but two of them get built. And so to me, that skyline, a lot of people, you know, Peter's mentioned it, the, 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 these buildings appear on tea towels. But to me, you know, surface paradise is my hometown. It's, it's the image. It's, I've watched it grow. It's... Um, so, so to me, that's the image, you know, that I think of of Queensland because that's that's the part that I that I come from. I'd like to see many more edgy tea towels <laughs> produced by and especially by Indigenous artists. So I think there's an enormous array of tea towel design that we could we could do. So if you're being naughty about Michael's hometown, <laughs> I think a tea towel of um, the Canal Estates on the Gold Coast. <laughs> The and sand then, pump. And then a second, then a second tea towel showing what one, a one metre um, typhoon would do to the Canal Estates <laughs> would, would have a certain resonance for some people. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Will you please join me in thanking our amazing panel? Uh, before you run off, we do have a lucky door prize winner, um, which of course is some tea towels. Uh, so, blue A60. <laughs> is there a winner? Yay! <laughs> um, oh, and also uh, thank you to Megan, who I uh, didn't even notice took it, taking a break. <laughs> uh, the exhibition is just down the hall, um, and that's we open to eight. I really recommend mm. uh, getting in and having a look uh, if you haven't managed to do that yet. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Jane.